Welcome to Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins, and uh, we welcome you to another session. This is going to have some real interesting stuff coming up tonight, this morning, this afternoon, whenever, wherever, and however. It doesn't exist, Randy. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It doesn't. That's Emily. Hey, Em. Hi. How's everybody doing? Just uh, gl- g- glad to be back. And uh, before we get into the show, I just... Um, I was mentioning to our guests and to Randy before that um, I went to the Depeche Mode concert last night and it was really good. But man, also like it was, um, and I don't find these things to be bad things anymore, but man, it was really, it was really triggering in some ways. Like, um, the mu- Their music, um, that was some of the, like, I loved that when I was like in seventh and eighth and ninth grade. Um, that was the first music t-shirt I ever had was a Depeche Mode t-shirt. And uh, it was so interesting, like in the days kind of leading up to it, I was thinking about that music a lot and sort of remembering those times. And it was very interesting how, uh, what the music meant to me then and what it meant to me now and how like the same lyrics, like in hindsight, like I just, the way it sort of music over time intertwines with your life and what it means sort of when you first hear it. And then um, in hindsight, especially with all the other things we know about how this stuff is you know, how it's, how this stuff is used to program us, but you know, how this music is also just really amazing. Their music is amazing. And it was a great show. If anybody out there, they're still having played in New York City, I highly recommend it. It's the best music the Tavistock Institute had to offer. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things that it's like, you know, I can't explain it, but like there's, there, there's some music you're like, yeah, this is just good music or this is just crap music. But and in, in, in all fairness, this Depeche Mode, has maintained a real high level over the years. I, their music really cuts into the core of a lot of things. So what's, what's going on in the background is a little bit more complex than just the synth pop that you think you're hearing with them. Yeah, it, was, um, it was very like, you know, there's some of this music you hear, I mean, it's good, some of it's crap, but, you know, whatever. There's a, a few select, uh, or there's sort of like a thread of artists or, or like a certain group of artists that their music has, it, it, it's something else, man. It means something else. It has all of this sort of um, kaleidoscopic array of uh, stuff intertwined with it. And Depeche Mode is definitely that. And at least to tell you, Dave Gahan was a phenomenal. I used to listen to them, but I never really watched them before. Um, he's a fantastic performer. And I never, I didn't realize he was so flamboyant. I, like he was very flamboyant and very charismatic. And they all still sound great. Like sometimes you go see some of these older bands and they've lost a little bit, but it's still fun to hear their music. These guys haven't lost it. And they actually really seem to be enjoying themselves, like certainly much more than they were 10 or 15 years back when they were having some issues with drugs and whatever. Yeah, a lot less Coke now. Well, yeah, I think Dave Mahan was into heroin and he, he, he seemed so happy and just so in his element last night. And it was really good. And the sound was unreal. Like the music just sound, their music sounds amazing live. It, some of it almost actually sounded kind of different than it does when you hear it on the radio, but it, different better. It was really good. I had a really good time. So everybody go check out the Pesh Mode. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, we have a guest, yeah. as you know, but I don't. So let's bring our guest on. Um, we know him, you know him as Medicine Bear White Bow. And he is... Um, survivor of mind control programs going back to childhood, specifically MK, MK Delta. He is also a practitioner of Native American lore, medicine, healing, the use of drum circles, the use of um, the pipe. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that, but uh, we want to welcome Medicine Bear back to Off Planet TV, Off Planet Radio. Hey guys, thanks for having me. It's good to have you back on, brother. Um, Anybody that's seen the previous show that we did with you in uh, Storm, which was uh, a little over, I guess, about a year ago, um, we'll know some of the backdrop to this and some of the things that we're going to talk about there. I thought maybe leading off for this talk, um, you're actually right now moving into a very big 
gear up program with the lodge that you had and um, some of the things that you've envisioned for a long time in terms of being able to put together a lodge, do drum circles, and to bring people into a place of using the Native American lore for healing. Tell us a little bit about that as well as uh, a little bit about yourself, brother. Well, uh, as far as Rainbow People's Medicine Lodge goes, it's, it's been a very fluid, flowing, changing river of sorts. And uh, sometimes the, the stream gets a little stopped up and as things slow down and, and then next thing you know, the dam breaks and it just, it's a gush, gusher. And uh, the last nine months I have had an overabundance of email, snail mail, telephone calls. When are we, we're coming to Las Vegas. We're trying to find a sweat lodge. I had some TV producers that contacted me. Um, they're getting ready to shoot. I'm not sure what the movie is going to be or who's in it or anything like that, but uh, his talent scout had contacted me and uh, I'm not even sure who, which producer it is, but coming out and um, January and they want to have a place to come and take all their people and put them through a sweat lodge. And um, that kind of got the juices flowing a few months ago. And what's happened since then is the place I've been in and here in North Las Vegas, um, we had an opportunity, the property became available. So we jumped on it and we went ahead and bought it and we closed two weeks ago. So now the property is ours. And now we can transform it exactly into what we want. I haven't had for going on six years, a property large enough to hold a medicine lodge and hold the teachings, a place to do um, weekend teachings, which are basically indoor or outdoor, sitting at a table or sitting around a fire and talking about things like the, the medicine wheel, what an eagle feather is, what, what the pipe is, what the ceremonies are, why we do the ceremonies, um, how they came to be, how I came to be the caretaker of the lodge. This is a tradition and Rainbow People's Medicine Lodge is an extension of a lodge which started back in California six generations ago. So this has been going on for a very, very, very long time. Long line of uh, medicine teachers that I've had and things have just progressed. I just happen to be one of the students that was in the right place at the right time to and be willing to do what was necessary. When grandfather or grandmother would call upon somebody to step up to do certain things, I was there. And as a result, I started getting more and more teachings than other people were getting. And eventually what wound up happening is grandfather retired from what he was doing. He became ill. Grandmother got up in age and she, it was time for her to transition out and to worry about taking care of her own needs and, and not be worried so much as a group of people. And so she passed on the teachings and uh, as it turned out, I took all that information, wound up moving down into Pahrump, Nevada for a while. We had the lodge up and running um, for about three years and things were going really good and then things just slowed off and then wound up moving out here into the metropolitan area of Las Vegas. And um, it's just taken the time that it's taken. And now is the right time for getting the lodge up and going again. Um, I'm waiting on, as you know, a brother and sister to get into town. Um, and then we are going to set the intention and what's going to happen with that. We'll set up the intention and we will actually build the lodge, the sweat lodge itself, and conduct the very first ceremony and set the intent for the next coming year. And that lodge will be up and running from that point on permanently. But uh, the core people will be the core people that, that are closest to me that will be coming in to help me set the intention for that. We'll put the prayer ties into it. We'll put all the, the medicine into it and um, kick it off that way. And next, next month, we're starting off the lodge a little bit differently than I I've done in the past. We're going to start off with a conducting a monthly drumming circle. And it's just basically where we're going to be using music to heal, um, using the heartbeat of the mother to get back in touch with who we really are instead of this false 
garbage that is out here that has been projected for so long. And Las Vegas is a mecca for just the unfathomable. Yeah, given recent events, I say so. <laughs> but uh, as, as far as my background goes, um, Blackfoot adopted into the Apache and um, carried teachings also from the Cherokee people, which is also one of my bloodlines. So I'm, I'm kind of a Heinz 57 Native American, um, for lack of a better way of expressing it. Um, also carry Celtic bloodlines, and that is something that I'm working with a couple of other practitioners because of, for whatever reason, the powers that be chose to keep me away from that, and we'll get into that obviously in the second hour, but um, that was a part of my heritage that they wanted to keep me from for whatever reason. They felt that my being exposed to the Native American side would benefit them, so I got to be allowed to participate and learn all that I could. And thankfully I, I've had that because if it wasn't for those, those teachings and the, and the core values that that gave me, I don't know that I would have survived the, the other stuff that, the, that they put me through. You know, it's interesting you bring up um, the Celtic tradition alongside the native American. To me, the two do not seem distinct. I see huge overlaps in the cultures and I see the culturally, they're both very close to the, the earth spirit. Oh yeah. And even when you start to look at some of the lore in the background, there's, there's some striking parallels between them. It's like they were either parallel cultures or cultures that diverged. I'm not sure, but I've always had this sense that there's something intertwining the native American with specifically what we call the Celtic tradition. Yeah. And uh, um, no, no, no. Is, what, is there anything specific you want me to go into as far as the lodge goes, as far as the, the history of it? And, I have, I have and a question I, before we get sure. to the lodge. Uh, is it intention or by happenstance that you're choosing to do this in an area like Las Vegas? This was actually the last place that I wanted to do this. It was, uh, my intention has been for a better part of two years now to get out of Las Vegas altogether. Actually have a big pull for uh, Pennsylvania or at least that far on the East Coast. And that's what I was thinking is that, okay, I'll just wait, we'll get there, then I'll go for it. Well. Turns out creators got plans that, you know, I wasn't aware of and I'm, I'm along for the ride. So it didn't turn out that way. So we want now, now we have the property. We're transforming the backyard. We've transformed the inside of the house. It's our living space, but it's also now registered here in, in Nevada. We're registered as a quote unquote church because that's Nevada. That's Nevada state law. Right. You have to, right. And to protect myself when I do counseling work and one-on-one -on -one work, I had to be registered as an ordained minister. So I went through all that process and, and do that. Now I can do everything in, in Nevada with the exception of conduct a wedding. And I'm not willing to go through the required hoops and, and, and yeah. that you'd have to, to do that and, and pay the fees. It's uh, at this point, I think it cost me, I think well, I checked into it a few months ago, it would be about $1,700 to get all the licensing for it. Wow. But when my mother passed away a few years ago, I, I was the one that conducted the ceremony for her and um, it was all done legal. I was able to sign off on all the documents and everything like that. And so there are some advantages to it. Um, it, it dawns on me that, and Randy and I have discussed this a few times in recent shows since Las Vegas has been hot on people's mind, that, uh, you know, there's a reason that they chose to build the city of Las Vegas the way they did where they did. Mm -hmm. so the same elements that lie in the ground there can also be, can do, you know, can be conducive going the other way to something spiritual and whatnot. And, you know, they're, unfortunately they're using the sort of na the natural potential of the place and the frequency of the place to do something uh, destructive, but the, it's still natural energy and natural potential and it can be taken the other way. And it dawns on me that it, you know, at this time, that at this time in particular, I mean, it's been for a long time, but especially now, that area needs a different kind of balance to the energy. That is. Yeah, and, and then with 
obviously the recent events that have just taken place here, um, it's become more apparent to me that we're exactly where we need to be doing exactly what we need to be doing. And the time is ripe for, for, for doing this. Like you said, it's in dire need of, of the other side of the spiritual aspect of it, which it doesn't have. It's got the sin and chaos and drama and, and all the obvious stuff that comes with it. And yeah, maybe just maybe we can plant a few seeds and offset and maybe we can twist that energy to, to going back in the right direction rather than this backward energy that is here. Yes. And um, so that's the hope, you know, I, I, I try to look at it from the perspective, okay, this is not what I intended. This is not what I actually wanted, but this is what needs to happen. And I'm just a tool for creators. So I'm going to do what I'm told to do. And that's what I've been doing for quite a while. I mean, I, I sit on a couple of different councils, not just a native American council. I sit on a Nordic Celtic council and, um, I'm a lower, lower echelon in that particular council, but uh, that's okay. You know, um, we're. Uh oh. Yeah, I figured that was going to happen. So we got to freeze up. Yeah. Let's see if he comes back. Let's see. I'm going to pause the recording. Or something. I don't know what you want to call it. We lost there for a minute, but he's back. And I think where we were at, we were talking about you, you, you know, your work, uh, you ending up in Las Vegas, even though that wasn't your intention, and you know, sort of working to um, reverse or uh, you know, correct or heal some of the uh, energies and the misuse of that going on there. So carrying on from there. Okay. <laughs> God, I lost lost track of where I was at. Well, for anybody that doesn't know, we were knocked off for mm, almost five minutes. Yeah, yeah. I went and checked out there. There's a there's a van out in front. They're having their fun. So, okay, good. Hey guys. <laughs> yeah. like Hi. Have a coffee. <laughs> Relax. Oh God. But uh, anyway, you know the, the the whole transition with the lodge has been a. a an ongoing metamorphosis to, for lack of a better way of, of putting it. And it, it's really been a wonderful thing. I've got, I've got, well, I've got now I've got students in Puerto Rico, Guam, New Zealand. Um, and I wouldn't even really like, I, I don't like to use the term students anymore because they're practitioners in their, in their own right. All I did was rough off some of the rough edges and give them a little bit, some tools and, teaching that they didn't necessarily quite have. And I've got one that she's, she's off and running now and she's uh, working with plant medicine primarily in, in Puerto Rico. And it's, I just heard back from her finally after the disaster down there and um, wonderful, just the things that are going on. I mean, we, we get, we never know where the seeds are going to actually grow. It's, so it's just my job just to throw the, throw the seeds out there and let them plant and flourish where they go. And it's, it's not up to me. It's in, it's just been an, an incredible journey. The, uh, everything about the lodge has been, and those teachings, like I was saying before we got so rudely interrupted was, uh, tools that I've been able to use to pull myself out of the muck and mire and, and the garbage and come back up out of the sludge and, and, I think of for a better person overall. Um, can you, can you, can you just for the audience and, and for us as well, like tell us about like if somebody comes to you to uh, for healing or for instruction or to do a sweat or whatever, what what kind of things do you do, what, go through with them? What kind of practices and uh, <sighs> sort of what that is? Well, first and foremost, I, I I get a feel for the individual. I usually do a one on one counseling and and. Uh, to spend an hour or two with them and get to know them, get to know their background, where they've been, what they've, okay, so you're, you're coming to me for this. Why? What drew you to me? What, what is it about what I'm doing or that you think that I can offer that is calling to you? And ask probing questions, kind of like, you know, like you guys do as, as journalists. Um, you want to get to the meat and potatoes. Okay, you're going there, but you're not quite there. So here, let me guide you a little bit more and, and take you a little bit deeper and uh, basically do the same thing. And 
find out what it is they've been through. And of course, like the last gentleman that we had a few months ago, he came with what he thought was quote unquote, a soul attachment. Well, as it turned out, it wasn't, it was an actual physical medical condition that he was dealing with. So sent him to the professionals and we did some of the work and crystal work and healing work on him. But uh, he actually needed more than that. It turns out he was, dealing with some other issues that uh, I couldn't really, couldn't really address. They're, they weren't necessarily spiritual issues to, per se. And if that turns out to be the case, you know, by all means, here you go. And with what I do, I know there's a lot of teachers and practitioners out there that charge exuberant amounts of money and uh, come for me, come to me for a weekend. It's going to cost you $500. We'll give you the sweat lodge. We'll do this. We'll do that. And you're going to walk away richer for it. Well, no, you're not. You're going to walk, walk away with your pocketbook being depleted and not really gaining anything of any value that's of any use to anybody. Um, and I don't do that. I, I don't charge a dime for anything I do. I never have. And I, I don't see the point of it. The teachings came to me freely. I paid dearly for what I have. But everything comes around in different ways. I've got people that come and the lodge is self-supporting. So if you want what we have, I'll provide the space for it. Bring something to support it. That means bringing food to share. That means we always need people come, they use the restroom, bring toilet paper, bring paper towels, bring paper plates, bring something for what you're getting. And that's kind of the way, the way it's been. I think that's what separates what we do versus what like a lot of the Tony Robbins and, and people like that do. And it's, it, or the Corey Goods and the rest of those cornflakes. They just, you know, they, you pay it, you pay a couple hundred dollars for a weekend seminar listening to these. Gotta be nice, I'm on radio. Um, <laughs> Actually, you find, don't. You're on off planet radio. <laughs> find upstanding individuals uh, talk out the side of their necks. And I'm all about okay, you want to learn about this. Well, I'm here to teach teachers. Each one of each, each person I work with, regardless of what walk of life they come from, you're a teacher in your own right. You're, we're all students. We're all teachers. We all have something to give and we all have something to learn. And um, that's kind of the methodology that goes through my mind. And as far as the one-on-one, -on -one, like I said, I, I try to get a feel for the person, what they've been through, what teachings have they had, have they had any teachings, okay, if you've been exposed to Native American spirituality, in, in what aspect? What was your teacher like? What, was, what is the lineage of your teachings? Where does it come from? Do you know the history? Because there should be a, a, a lineage that you can go back and, and trace where this person came from, where they learned from, where their teachers learned from. And in my case, I have all that information, which is wonderful. And I think that also gives somebody a sense of security a sense of knowing it's like um you're not just going to some pseudo person like um unfortunately i'm going to use him again a david wilcox or a Corey good you know the person you know where they're coming from you know what their background is you know all that aspect as far as that stuff goes so and i think that that's important you need to be able especially with spiritual matters you need to be able to give a historical background of where your stuff came from like in my, my case, it goes back six generations. It didn't just come out of a hat. I didn't learn it in a book. Everything I've, I've learned is firsthand knowledge. And it, I've learned from some of the last actual, quote unquote, full-blooded Native Americans that there were out there. And a lot of them were, a lot of my teachers were also mixed, mixed medicine. Uh, that's where a lot of the Celtic and Druidic and uh, Viking teachings come from. It's, a, it's an eclectic I'm not full-blooded, uh, I don't have full-blooded Lakota traditions to fall back on. It's a very eclectic pot from which I pull the medicine from. But as far as the actual traditions of like each ceremony that I carry, that I teach, there is a very specific thing that goes. And those things are kept pure and in order in the way that they were given. That is the way that it is taught. And if you are going to do this down the road, there are years and years and years that you have to go through to um, learn how to pour water for the sweat lodge. To be a sweat lo leader 
it's not something that anybody wants to just dive in and do. You'll take a chance on killing people. As we saw happen a few years back in Sedona. Um, and I was on the board of directors that went down and talked and had to counteract what that individual did. And um, tell, tell folks about that, that incident. I'm sorry, what? Tell folks about that incident. Oh, God. It's, what was that? that? That was a 96, 90, 98. No, that was uh, 98 back now, wasn't it, I think. I vaguely remember this, but I don't, I don't have any details. Uh, it's, it's, it's been long enough now that I don't remember all the specifics of it. But um, basically what he did is he took his book knowledges. He, was, he, he was, had been writing a lot of self-help books, and he was a, a self-help guru. I forgot the gentleman's name at this point. He uh, took people into, down into Sedona. They went into a, a secluded area. He built a huge sweat lodge. They put chains and locks on, on, on sweat lodge doors so people were actually locked in there, and they could not get out. Wow. And that's just stuff that you don't do. And what wound up happening because they didn't know what they were doing, they overheated people in a, in a desert environment in the middle of summer and people died. What and, on earth would, would be the reason for locking somebody in? That, that doesn't make any sense. I don't, I, don't, I don't think he ever came forward with a logical explanation as to why they, they did, did that. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer. I wish I did. Um, but th those are just things you just don't do. Uh, and it, 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 this is really a calling. It's not something that I went seeking. It's not something that I actually wanted. In fact, when I was very young and I was first told, this is going to be your path, I ran. I wanted no part of it. It scared the living hell out of me. But it's to like appealing of the onion. You always come back to where you start from and there's always more lessons to learn. And you're not done with it until you're done with it. And it just turned out. Can I ask what may be like a very silly basic question, but as a question probably some of the listeners have, um, and I do, I've never done a sweat. What would be, what is, I mean, I know a little bit about them, but like, what is the, what is the purpose? Like, what is the benefit? What is the, um, what would be the reason that somebody like me would, uh, would want to do a sweat. Well, consider the sweat lodge the womb of Mother Earth. So you go into the you go into the lodge, and you're coming out to be reborn. So you go in with all the garbage that you carry as an adult, and you come out purified from all that garbage, and you get to dump it. Um, it's a way to cleanse. It's a way to cure, cleanse and purify your spirit. Um, reconnect with what really matters. Earth, trees, stones, the wind, birds, the animal kingdoms, the mineral kingdoms, and bring and incorporate that back into your life and get more earth-based. What we used to be like prior to all the technology and, and everything else. Um, if you want to get back in balance, get out of the UV lights, get out of the artificial lights like I have in the room, like you guys have in your room right now. Take your sleeping bag out, sleep on top of Mother Earth, and you'll ground back out. If you want to get back in sync, get back in touch with nature. The nature's from where we came and nature's to where we will return. So it makes sense. If you want to get back in tune, where are you going to go? You're not going to go to, to Radio Shack. You're going to go to Mother Earth. You're going to go back out to nature. Go spend a day out hiking. Go spend a day out fishing. Go spend a day out sitting by a tree listening. Just listening to the wind. Yeah. watching the animals and see how you feel afterwards. Uh, generally speaking, if I'm having an off day, take off my shoes and socks, go sit out in the grass and reconnect. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Oh, yeah, totally. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm all for um, hugging trees and laying flat on the dirt and all that. I mean, I literally, people laugh at me sometimes when I'm on my walk because I'll, like, I'll just see a tree and I'll decide that I want to go hug that tree and I will go there and <laughs> walk around the tree and people laugh and I don't care. And, but there is a connection that happens. Like I, like, I always like to sort of close my eyes when I'm doing everything and kind of see what happens in the back. And you can energetically see the electricity that happens when you make contact with your body and you sort of merge with the tree because there is a palpable um like you know fusion that sort of takes place um and i also work with a lot of people that deal with a lot of addiction and addiction in all of its different forms how do you break the cycle well here again 
reconnect to what and who you really are. Do you know who you are? How do I do that? Well, I'm not Native American. Am I, can I do this? If you're called to this, you're called to it. It doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter. And my, 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 my teacher was very specific. He told me, and she told me, both of them, grandmother and grandfather, both told me the same thing at the same time, as a matter of fact. Said that there's going to be a point in time where you're going to be called upon to teach. And when they come, you will teach. That's it. Didn't say anything about race, color, or creed, because none of that matters. It's what's in. It's what's in here. It's what your soul is. It's what your soul calls to. If you're called to this, I will be there. And uh, it doesn't matter to me what your ethnic background is. It doesn't matter to me what your educational background is, because ultimately, all of that is superficial anyway. So, what is real? Well, what is tangible? Spirit is tangible. Our soul is tangible. Our soul is everlasting. This vessel is eventually going to give way and go bye-bye. Yep. But my Absolutely. soul will continue on into, into, it, into the next phase. And then the next phase after that, whatever comes after that. Third, fourth, fifth level um, ascension. And, you know, we're, we're all in that time, time period. We're, we're starting to see all, all the chaos and everything getting drummed up. But we're also starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel where we're going to ascend to a higher level and a higher level of existence where we aren't going to need these physical meat suits anymore. You know, the, 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 this is false. This isn't real. What's inside and who my soul, that's what's real. The soul that you have, that's what's real. We can connect from here in North Las Vegas. I can connect with Emily up in Northern California like that, you know, and, and given the right circumstances. No, you can't. No, you can't. Because <laughs> I'm in Southern California, so you can't. <laughs> uh, I had it wrong. I'm fucking with you. <laughs> but but, yeah, but, but, if, but when, when my bilocation skills are on point, then you'll be able to connect with me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm kidding. Sorry to, sorry to distract, but I thought that was That's funny. okay. You know, I'm... I'm willing to go wherever we, we need to go and where, wherever is appropriate. Let's just, let's just go. Let's just take I have, this. I have one more question about where we were at. So you said like a lot of people come to you with like uh, addiction issues and whatever. Like I'm, I have, I know people in my life who've done sweat lodges as part of trying to uh, come off of drugs or, or alcohol or, you know, even, you know, eating issues and whatever. Um, so is that like, is the idea just basically that all those toxins and then all of the sort of um spiritual imprint that is like on those toxins in your body have built up and by sweating that out that gives you an opportunity to sort of i think i think i think it helps a lot of, especially when you're talking of like alcoholism or, or drug addiction of, uh, in particular that's part of the process you have to get rid of the toxins that are in the body before you can and, and that's one way to, to to pull them out um, I think it's an easier, softer way than, than possibly going to a detox center yeah. where they put you on pharmaceutical medications, which also have their own side effects and drawbacks to it. So this is a more natural way to come off of some of those things. And maybe you're lost. You don't, you're a spiritual individual, but you don't know where you quite fit in. Well, here's something that you can latch onto. Maybe this isn't your calling, but this gives you a foundation from which to build, you know, well, I'm really drawn to crystals. Well, I teach crystal healing. Let's go for it. What do you want to learn? What do you want to know? Um, I, I, I think it, the lodge in itself offers just one single pathway yeah. to opening up several other doors. You know, and like people come to me and they, they say, well, you can see right through me. You can see what I can't see. No, I, I can only, I can look in a door, but it, it's the door that you open. It's your door. All you have to do is be willing to turn around and look, and you can see inside that door too. So that's what I teach people. Look inside the door yourself. I'll teach you how to look inside the door that you're asking me to look into. I can see what you're asking for, but I'm going to teach you how to do it. Rather than come to me and it's like, well, you're going to, you can make millions of dollars, Barry, if you just, if you just take people's money and, and, and give them all this information. It's like, yeah, I could. But then I got to live the karma of that. I'd rather teach somebody how to do what I do. 
I'd rather see somebody do what I do more successfully, do it better. You know, I hope to see, and I've got, I've got one student that, that has taken off in a full, full fledged run. And, uh, what she has going now is far beyond anything I could have ever dreamed up. And that's her calling. And, and that's awesome. She's teaching the sweat lot. She's teaching the medicine wheel. And she's got all these people that are coming to her. And I'm like, that is wonderful. She goes, I don't know what to do. I don't have any more free time. You've got all the free time in the world. You're doing something that you love. You're doing something that calls to you. And you're doing it in a right way. And you're getting your needs met. Your bills are paid. You have a roof over your head. You're eating every day. What more could you possibly want or need? You know, and it's, it's, this is not for the faint of heart. You know, the medicine path is definitely not for the faint of heart. And I wouldn't recommend it from the perspective of what I do for just anybody. Um, this was a no holds barred. I made an agreement. And when I made that agreement, it was for life. I, it's not something I can walk away from. Um, as a brother of ours that we both know very well, who's been incognito for quite a while now, but uh, yeah. um, he's, he said it in several of the radio talks that he's done. Uh, you know, I, I, I made an agreement when I walked, walked away and I awakened from the whole MK Ultra reality. And my, my agreement was that I would fight for humanity. I won't fight for the cabal. I won't fight for the global elite. I will fight to exterminate what they have been, what they have perpetrated. And that's what I stand for. And uh, that commitment's for life. The medicine path is not something that, it, this is, it's not, I don't play Indian. I, this is what I, this is who I am. This is what I live. This is my day to day existence. This is all I do. And um, without it, in the, a part of me would be there would be a part of me that would be missing at this point i'm wondering I, if you could maybe talk about this a little bit because part of your own journey kind of connects this healing path with you dealing with your own background so talk a little bit about i call it i use the term soul retrieval there's a lot of different concepts that are baked into that, that essentially it has to do with bringing back in the core. And I'm not just even talking about survivors of black ops programs. I'm talking about many people who have been through traumatic issues of being able to reclaim the inner place, the place that it's kind of like what we were as children. It was kind of that untouched place that seems like it got fractured, fragmented, fouled, violated in a thousand different ways in the course of life, whether it was in secret program or relationship or um, just the normal course way through life. So how do, you, how do you integrate what you do with your own healing path? Well, you know, you know very well after, you know, us getting to know each other and, and, and uh, knowing a lot of what, what's, what I've been through personally and uh, kind of walking with me through that journey up to this point. Um, there, there, there's no easy, no easy answer to this. It's, it's, an ongoing thing. I mean, there's new stuff and new doors that break down all the time. And um, integration is a constant thing that's still happening for me. I don't have all the pieces. I don't know that I ever will. Um, the compartmentalization that they do to you is horrendous. And the way that they go about doing it is even worse. Uh, torture, drugs. And you, I mean, you. I'm not saying anything that it's not already known and out there that you guys have talked about in the past. Um, when the opportunity presents itself though, now I have an opportunity. Okay. I'm not feeling right. What's going on. I now have a pathway by which to kind of guide myself to an understanding and, and to come to a, to a, to a, a decisive conclusion as to, okay, this is what happened. Okay, this is 
I think this is what happened and then diving into it more and being able to, to clearly have a pathway to, to walk down to uh, navigate to, okay, this is a false memory versus this is a real memory. Now, how do I, how do I combine and integrate the two of those so that I have a truth? That's a bitch. That's a bitch. But see, that um, actually is the labyrinth that I think most of us walk. You're the extreme edge of it. Survivors are the extreme edge of it. But somewhere in the middle of the, the continuum, most people, and Emily and I have talked about this, this sense of broken frames, like parts of our lives that have been cut out, like, like, like film. And you have the sense that there's something there that doesn't belong there, and also something that's missing that was taken out. Well, you know, when I started diving into it, like in one instance, um, I started diving back. It's like I had all these memories of summers being in a particular place in, a, in Southern California that mm -hmm. never existed. It didn't, it does not exist, it never did exist. It wasn't real. Where did and you think you were? A place called Camp Woodchuck. And it, the camp never existed. The place never existed. Yeah. It wasn't real. Where it was did, an Where did you think this was? Uh, somewhere near um, Anzabrego, in the Anzabrego desert area. That's interesting. You know, it's interesting. I so when you say it doesn't exist, are you saying that you can't find any evidence that it existed, or that you're is that what you're saying? You yeah, find? I've done. I, I mean, so obviously, I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be yeah. We've had this conversation. <laughs> like, like, okay, hold on. I, I haven't had this conversation with him, so let me have it with him. And, yeah. And, okay, so you're saying that like you you have memories of being there, memories of things that went on and you went looking for evidence of it and you can't find any evidence that it ever existed or your parents told you that you didn't go there or what, how is it that you're like, what exactly do you mean? Uh, one of the, the things that was a big red flag for me was that no photographs, supposedly, you know, summer vacations and this that, and the other, there, there are sets of photographs where I know that, okay, we were there together as, as a supposed family, and these things were real. These are actual bona fide, real Kodak photographs. I can, I can verify that this was actually done on film, and I can I can see the, the date on it. I can go back, and if I really wanted to, in some instances, okay, 1979, this photograph was taken here, and here's a verified place, here's a monument, here's something that, that verifies that this place actually exists. Now, I've gone back in the records in California extensively, and Camp Woodchuck did not exist. So you have pictures of this place that you thought was Camp Woodchuck. When you go looking for Camp Woodchuck, you can't find it. Exactly. Okay, so I, like, the only reason I asked is because I had a very similar thing happen in that, like this camp that I went to when I was younger that was not just very close to my house. I tried certain, and I had bizarre things go on for me there. I did, a, my dad remembers me going there. He took me there every day and whatever. But when I did a search on the internet, I couldn't, I couldn't find anything either. I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find any reference to it. I couldn't find, you know, Facebook has a group for everything. People who used to go to the ranch club, people who used to go to Camp Winter, couldn't find any of that stuff, couldn't find anything at all. But I, I searched many times. My, finally, one time I had my dad search and he, could, he couldn't find, he was able to find one thing and it was like an around the way reference. And the only reason he even understood that it was that was because he remembered that he knew the person that ran the camp. And so this was a, something that came up with that person's name in it, but really no reference to the camp, right? So I sometimes wonder if these things are, a, a, obviously possibly being buried online, but in particular, maybe specifically being buried for those of us who would go looking for them. So if somebody else goes and looks, they might find something, right? Somebody who has no connection to you or none of this weird stuff. I think there are different internets. I think different internets exist for all of us. Uh, but I, I, that's, it, it, it's one of the most... Um, odd and fascinating things of this journey, isn't it? Yes, you heard it here first, folks. There are many <laughs> internets. <laughs> there are, Remember this. Right? There, there are many summer camps and there are many internets. There are <laughs> many summer camps and there are many experiences. Yes. And this is not the reality you're looking for. <laughs> I knew I knew instantly 
when Bear said that story, what you were thinking, Emily, because we've had that conversation before yeah. about. Yeah, so th this camp, Camp Woodchuck, what, is it like a place you went with your family or was it a summer camp you went to individually and then Supp go back to your family? Supposedly after? it was a summer camp that boys went to. Mm -hmm. What I found out since is that the one, f there, I, do, I did come across one photograph, which unfortunately, I wasn't quick enough to download it. I went into my adoptive father's page before he shut me out. And he had a picture of him with me in front of this place. Well, it turns out it wasn't what I thought it was. Uh, the place that the photograph was actually taken, because I was able to go back and through the archives and, and look it up, was the Presidio. And <laughs> Okay. That, that, uh, but that's even okay. So it, that's it, pretty intense. That, that's super interesting. So you, to you, you thought the camp was in Southern California, and you thought this was a picture of you at the camp, but the picture was a picture of you at the Presidio in Northern California. Correct. That's fascinating. So that now my my question next would be: Was there any kind of were you able to find any records of any camp near the Presidio? Not a one. Because that, like, okay, because so the int the only reason I'm asking this is because, so for me, the camp that I went to backs right up against Rockadine and Spawn Ranch in Chatsworth in, in, in Southern California, right? So the thing that we could have thought was a summer camp was really just like a backdoor entrance to those things, right? So I'm wondering if there was some sort of faux summer camp being run somewhere around the Presidio that was just like, oh yeah, I'm dropping my kid off at you know, Camp Woodchuck or whatever, but it was really going to the Presidio. But in a kid's mind, especially if they're spending, you know, very long periods of time there, and you're a little kid, if you're in the car for a couple of hours or whatever, or even just, you know, that's the, you could, I mean, kids don't have the same sense of reference for like space and time that you have in a, as an adult. You know, do you think that there could be anything like that where they were just telling you you were going to Camp Woodchuck, but you were going to the Presidio? That's what I've come to understand is most likely probable as to what actually took place okay. in my in my particular case. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what went on at Camp Woodchuck? <laughs> I, I'm, you may you probably in the course of the years you guys have been doing this and it's specifically with regards to MK Ultra have heard the term the chair. Okay. Now. I spent a lot of time in, 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 in a device that we've referred to as the chair, hooked up to electrodes and um, IV drips and fun little cocktails, LSD mixed with other, other things to um, yeah. bring about what they wanted to bring about and break down the psyche along with like uh, electrical torture and, and the rest of it that comes with it. And, uh, you know, so what I thought was Camp Woodchuck was Camp Whore. And uh, I was just recently talking to Randy about this a, a few weeks ago that uh, these are relatively fresh memories that are, are uh, obviously still a bit on the painful side to deal with, but uh, that's okay. Um, Yeah, I just happened to catch. My I'm, wife. I'm, I'm feeling what you're feeling. I'm feeling an extreme yeah, amount of trouble. Yeah, no, this is. Uh, yeah. My wife just happened to catch something on YouTube, and um, she was watching it because it there. She, she was really into the Kathy O'Brien story. Mm -hmm. Well, the next video that popped up happened to be a little excerpt on retired Colonel. Michael Aquino. Yeah. I just happened to walk in a room. I didn't hear the name. I turned around and I looked at the t I looked at the the, the the image on a TV set and I just started I, I literally started throwing up. She said, Jesus, did you eat something? What's wrong with you? I said this individual, they're, they're, this sick individual, I, I know him. I remember him. The long as eyebrow that he had, I mean, just one freaky, nasty, vile individual. And um, 
it just it, it 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 just blows me away the level of protection people scumbags like this have had around them that they're, they're able to be allowed in a free world to continue doing whatever the, the crap and vileness that they're doing and uh after getting sick i of course got it extremely angry and upset and uh didn't sleep that night obviously and the next day when i was able to start formulating words uh she sat down with me because she's good at that and she's really good at keeping me grounded and we were able to start slowly and I, of course i i've got john storm here so i've started sitting down with him and he said like okay let me go through and, and let me do some research on this and let me bring up some images and we're going to sit down and see if this might be tough. So we sat down and he brought up, they brought up some images and it's okay. I want you to look at these and tell me what you feel. Well, I started recognizing the buildings and then I started recognizing the hallways and then I was describing the hallways and then I was describing the room numbers. Then I could, I, I could pretty much map out the layout of the entire place at the pursuit of where we, where we were. And it wasn't on the, the ground level floor. It was a basement level and um, all matters of horror and horrific things were taking place down there. It, and like I was telling Randy a few weeks ago, I thought at first that the connection I was seeing and the images I was seeing was a place up in upstate New York, which was Camp Hero. Never was there, thankfully. Uh, as far as I know, wasn't a bona fide member of the Montauk Project, which right. I'm, right. I'm, I'm glad for. But all of these projects were connected. Montauk yeah. was, was, was one pivot specifically on the East Coast. And then you had numerous operations that took place through the Southwest going up into uh, North, probably into Washington State and even further into Canada. These, yeah. There were centers to all of this. I mean, you had more players, uh, scientists, and different laboratories, but they were running parallel experiments. The chair was the big one. And I don't like, I don't particular. I don't, I know that, I know the term is out there and it's what most people would probably associate it with, but for the sake of this conversation, I'll use it, but uh, I don't understand. It's not a term I personally adopt for myself, but the Presidio is one of the major places where they were adopting and changing their 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 program for the so-called super soldier program. Mm -hmm. And in my case, uh, the assassination program, which was and still is MK Delta, and that is all that program is. It's all about assassination, wet work. That's all black ops. You're trained as a, trained to do that. That's what you're trained for. That's it. You're not there to make play patty cake or make nice with anybody or be a negotiator. You're there to be trained to be the 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 tool that they need to um, remove their opposition and remove them so that they can further their agenda. And uh, that's just kind of the way that that program is. I I I don't know how much you really want me to go into the. Uh, aspect of, of that because it's a lot of it is just downright violent and it it, it, it yeah makes... i don't think we need to go into the gruesome details i think people get the sense of where this was going emily do you have a question no no you just addressed it that's fine <laughs> <laughs> but you, I, mean, you just, yeah, I was gonna say basically what, what you said you know um so there may there may be some people. I mean, you did a little bit of an explanation there. There may be some people in the audience. We do have a lot of new listeners, and uh, you know, but also a lot of our listeners are in, are, are very familiar with. That there are different kinds of MK programs, but MK Delta is one that isn't spoken about as often. So, without getting into the gruesomes of it, can you give us a little bit more details on what exactly MK Delta is? Like everyone's really obviously very familiar with MK Ultra. Yeah. And the people are, you know, know about MK often, and and you know. MK's, you know, search and things like that, but um, what can you tell us a little bit more about MK Delta? Uh, different sub-programs. I mean, I, I, got, I, I got tested out for work in Monarch, which obviously wasn't my forte. I don't have the personality for it to um, 
be a play toy, but um, it started out with first and foremost, you know, talking with Duncan, I, I come to the same conclusion at the same time, at least in one period back, back in those days, uh, we were in the same place at the same time going through Project Talent where they basically were looking for what are you good at? What are you adapted for? Well, spiritual adaptation and I, 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 I carry the genes which were naturally calling for that. Native American bloodline, Celtic bloodline, naturally adaptable to um, all things supernatural and it, it just worked for me. The one of the fortes I, I carry with me is the uh, astral projection um, and being able to do that pretty much at the drop of a dime whenever I want and be able to travel wherever I want, see whatever I want. Wonderful tool if it's, and wonderful for the powers that be to find out about their enemies, what they're doing, what they're planning, where they're planning it, how they're planning it and being able to pull back, pull the information, bring the information back and give them a decisive map. Okay, well, such and such is going to be at such and such place at such and such time. Well, then they can send in an operative to take the person out or do whatever they're going to do. Later on, um, being trained more in soldiering aspects and what eventually wound up being that I found out is MK Delta, which was all government wet work and uh, working for all things spooky and, and um, being an expendable. Uh, uh, the last job I was supposed to be on, which is what led to some of the legal, legal problems I'm now still dealing with the aftermath of, uh, I broke down and I was no longer able to be activated and when they tried to activate me they tried to activate the self-destruct which which almost worked but it didn't and uh, I'm still here and as a result I've, I've now know exactly where at least half a dozen of the implants are um, definitely have one here one in the back of the neck palm of the hand um, typical spots that most people talk about and I've had those things verified. Of course, I don't take my own word for it. I worked with, with Duncan on, on a few things to get some things ver vetted and verified. It's like, cause I, I told Duncan early on, it's like, you know, I, if it ever comes to the point where I come out and I come forward, well, I want to make darn sure that number one, it, it's truthful, it's honest, and it's something that somebody can go back and say, Hey, you know, Barry, you said this at such and such date at such and such time. Okay, but here's the information that you can verify what I said, and you can you can vet it. You don't have to take my word for it. So people that have already been there and done that and and have gone through that process, and I mean, Randy, you know re real well that you know, especially with Duncan and 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 Storm, they don't take anybody's word at any value. They're gonna they're gonna go through your background. They're gonna go through your history before you're allowed in that inner circle. To, for any reason. And uh, I was no exception to that rule. Um, my saving grace was the person that was there first and foremost, who helped me to, to come to grips and come to terms with what is, was uh, David Corso before he passed away. Yep. And- uh, We know you're out there, Pops. You know, as, mu as much of a anal cavity as he could possibly be, I'm and would freely admit as much. I'm very grateful for yeah. him being there when he was. I mean, there, there's no mistake. And Dave, if he was here, would be the first one to admit that, hey, yeah, I'm an asshole. And uh, this is who I am. You can take it or leave it. I really don't give a damn. Oh, I've got him on record saying that. I actually <laughs> have a recording of him saying exactly that. But um, by all means, you know, yeah, I am. Obviously, I'm a little, a little bit unnerved and a little bit uncomfortable, but I'm okay. So, well, what we're going to do right now, since we're bumping right up on the first hour, is I think we'll take a break, catch a breath, get a drink, smoke a cigarette, um, do all the necessary things, and round this off, and come back on the second hour, which is a special segment 
And uh, we'll do that when we come back on the other side of Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. We'll be back in a few minutes or we'll be on the other channel. Well, if you guys, if you want to join us for the second hour and you haven't uh, joined us on Patreon yet, move on over to Patreon dash Off Planet Media, sign up and see the second hour.